And so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are now. Uh, we are in Europe, uh, different time zones, actually. I, I am in Italy, I am Paola Corti, and I am the Open Education Community Manager at uh, Spark Europe, working uh, within the European network of open education librarians to make open education, in this case, the default at European level. And together with me, uh, we have some colleagues here. <laughs> I'm happy to share this presentation with uh, Monique Schautzen from the Netherlands, uh, who is greeting now, <laughs> Celine Penyon from Ireland, <laughs> and uh, Chris, Christopher Mean again from Ireland, and Marta Bustillo too from Ireland. We should have had also a great colleague of ours, Kinga Zayak from Poland with us today. She did a great job together with us to create this presentation and mostly the activities that are behind it. But unfortunately, she was unable to join us today. So hi, Kinga, you're always with us. Um, as far as possible, and if you all agree, we would like not to share our presentation during this session because we prefer to see faces and human beings behind the screens, actually. Uh, but uh, please count on the fact that our presentation is already available in uh, SCAD uh, in our session page. And uh, I'm sure that someone is going to paste a link in the chat now so you can have it handy. So what are we uh, sharing with you today? Uh, what we are going to share today is our experience at the European level, for sure, with the academic librarians who are working together to build capacity uh, with their peers and uh, with my support when I can, uh, in order to make open education the default, and mainly in order to implement as far as possible the UNESCO ER recommendation at European level. So for those of you who are outside Europe, this is a, a different perspective. And for those of you who are from Europe, you are welcome to join our network if you are academic librarians. Uh, a couple of words about the annual. The annual was founded in 2018. Actually, it happened uh, during uh, an open education conference. It was uh, the OE Global Conference in TU Delft in the Netherlands. And uh, some academic librarians came together and thought about creating this network from scratch. Now we have uh, 85 members from 24 different countries around Europe. We are covering almost half of European countries. We are many, <laughs> I have to say. And what happens in the annual is that uh, we work together and uh, we share and uh, we collaborate. Those are our three keywords. Uh, being together, sharing, and collaborating. And that's what happened also with the, the people in the room today with me, because uh, we started uh, at the beginning of this year to think about some activities that can support more actively academic librarians in building uh, um, groundwork, I would say, around open education when uh, both on place in places and the libraries where something was already ongoing, but mostly uh, in places where open education is not in the picture yet. And uh, that's what we are trying to do, helping each other, sharing experiences, and also building uh, tools that can be reused uh, uh, by librarians, for sure, at European level, but also everywhere else because they are shared <laughs> with the open licenses, as you can easily imagine. Uh, what we are doing today with you, we are willing to share with you some of the uh, experiences that we are having together. And um, it's not only about the outputs that we are uh, going to share, some of them are ready and you will know about them during the session. Some others are on their way. Uh, they are going to be finalized. Some of them need still a little bit of thinking. Some others need hand to be finalized. But uh, what we are willing to share also is uh, 
the, uh, the landscape of the NOL, the context that we are living together and the welcoming environment that we are trying to build for each other so that everyone can really feel welcome whichever level of knowledge they have around open education and uh, um, whichever attitude they have in sharing it from the beginning or joining in later on. Uh, we are people. So what happens is that we all went through uh, the pandemic. We never met in person yet, and we are all willing to do it as soon as possible, but it never happened yet. So we are just working at a distance and uh, we are doing our best to support each other which means that uh, along the way today, we are going to share also what happened uh, here and there when uh, people were not able to attend or they were overloaded by work or overloaded by life, okay? <laughs> and uh, that's what happened so far. And um, I would start uh, with uh, sharing something about uh, the experiences that members are uh, giving to each other. And I would uh, leave the floor to Monique Schautzen, who uh, was uh, our first uh, NOL member under the spotlight. And uh, she's going to tell you what, what this means. But uh, she, she also became a member of this group in order to have other members under the spotlight. So Monique, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um... I'm the organizer of the um, practitioners in the spotlight sessions. Um, we've had two so far. So um, it was me um, who broke the ice and uh, it was uh, a bit stressful to do because I'm not a native speaker, so as you can hear. Um, but um, I got the message across and um, the spotlight sessions are half an hour of introducing yourself. So, uh, and, and then uh, a Q&A session of another half an hour. Um, it's very important to introduce ourselves um, to the group uh, because we, as Paula said, we haven't met each other uh, in real life. So um, it, it's good to know each other's background. And, and from the two sessions we had, we can already see that we are from very different backgrounds. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, part of the, those sessions. We're all librarians, but we are from uh, different countries in Europe. So we have uh, different levels of uh, in, in the open education. So um, different uh, points of view and, and, and different um, uh, accelerations, etc. cetera. Um, in November the 8th, uh, we will have our third session. Uh, my colleague, uh, um, Sylvia Moes from the Netherlands. Uh, the second speaker was from uh, Spain, uh, Gemma Santos Hermosa. Um, well, it's, it's just like uh, here being together and show our faces. Uh, we're not uh, robots, we are human beings. And um, if you know someone's background, you can better um, uh, discuss each other because uh, we all have different talents, languages and uh, backgrounds. So um, I hope I have given you some uh, background, uh, but... Uh, the next speaker uh, will go give some more uh, view of our activities. So I, I think, I hope uh, you understand the concept. I don't Thank see you. Thank you, Monique. Monique. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you, Monique. I think that uh, okay. I, I would Welcome. just add uh, another information for you. What happens in those webinars is that uh, we have a, a webinar session live within the NOL network in this case, but then all our uh, webinars are recorded and they are shared in our NOL YouTube channel. And uh, Yeah, I put a link uh, in, the, in the chat thank now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Monique. 
So uh, the idea is that uh, within the, the webinar, the, the environment is a, a friendly, informal, everyone can ask questions, etc. But then the idea is to share what we create together. Also, thanks to the wonderful questions that members ask each other with the, the larger community. And thank you, Monique. And if, if uh, you have any kind of questions, please just interrupt us and uh, ask them. You are more than welcome to do that or write them in the chat and we will uh, try to take care of them one by one immediately. Um, moving from the annual members to the, the people that are advocating around the ed open education at European level, but are not librarians, Another activity that, uh, that we are developing, uh, thanks to the great efforts done by Christopher Min, who is here in the room, and thank you, Chris, for that, is to invite open education champions to be interviewed by our librarians. And uh, again, this activity, as you can easily see, uh, shifts uh, the focus from the in, from inside of the librarians' uh, uh, environments and activities to the uh, people interacting with them. So all stakeholders, and uh, Chris is going to tell you more about this. So Chris, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks, Paolo, um, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, so yeah, so it's the uh, so I'm the project manager for the OE Champions uh, series of interviews and. Uh, as Polo explained, uh, it's, uh, the idea is to get uh, key OE advocates and actors, and these could be students, teachers, pedagogues, practitioners, um, to talk about the work that they're doing in an interview format uh, with a librarian. Uh, and sometimes that will be a librarian that they've worked with on projects. Uh, so, uh, so for example, Celine here uh, was one of our first uh, interviewers and did a great job uh, interviewing um, one of our champions, Catherine Cronin, who works here in Ireland. Uh, and um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting project and there's, there's, there's a couple of outputs from it. So basically we get uh, the interview going, we conduct it over Zoom, and then there's a couple of outputs, which includes the YouTube video of the uh, interview uh, that goes up onto the NOL YouTube channel. And then a, a web text uh, version of the interview uh, that goes up on a website, which is called um, uh, Open Scholar Champions, and, uh, and Paolo has just shared the link. Um, so if you, if you see that web page, it's basically three columns, and two of them have been populated already. There's Open Data Champions and Open Access Champions. We're the middle column that right now is blank. It's Open Education Champions, and so when we have all of our interviews together, that column is going to be an amazing uh, resource uh with all kinds of of uh uh you know inspiration and stories and, and dialogue uh about the open education space so it's a really exciting project we're kind of in the middle of it right now um uh it's it is a work in progress but we've done about a half dozen interviews we have a few more scheduled and a few more in the works those that we've done are in a kind of a post-production process we're not doing anything too fancy just adding a couple of uh, an intro and an outro uh and this kind of thing making sure the subtitles are in good shape um and uh, and so forth so uh so we're looking at a a completion date of mid-december so um uh, with any luck at, on, on at that time we'll we'll launch a really special resource that'll be of, of use for um uh people in europe people around the world um so um so that's that, that's about it i think it's it's uh it's 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 a great project i'm really excited to be involved with it thank you chris also for your enthusiasm uh just another thing that we might want to to add to this is that uh, as we said about the under the spotlight webinars also in this case what we are trying to do and it's not always easy, is to find champions from all European countries as far as possible. We are willing to cover all the, the countries that we have. And uh, this is not a secondary in our uh, everyday work because, uh, as you can easily imagine, having different languages, native languages, 
and having different uh, legal system, education system, and uh, everything is ongoing in Europe in order to uh, put all those systems talk to each other and uh, have uh, mm, consistency in between uh, the education path. Well, we are still <laughs> in the process for that <laughs> and a lot of work to be done. So having those champions uh, bringing forward the perspective of different countries is really key for us. And those, the same is, works for the members, uh, the academic librarians that Monique described, they are sharing uh, their national views. And uh, we are at very different levels in Europe uh, according to open education developments. So it's interesting to see this, uh, <laughs> this, this completely crazy picture that we are building <laughs> and putting together. Uh, thank you, Chris. So uh, another step that we are trying to, to do, and uh, it's uh, on its way, and uh, I would leave the floor to Marta Bustillo on this one, is to develop uh, an open learning path for European librarians. Because uh, if we think about all the librarians that are not uh, familiar with open education yet, we want them on board. We want them in our, in our scenario. We want them not only involved uh, one day, maybe in the annual, but first of all, in open education to be great advocates in the fields in their everyday life when they serve different stakeholders, students, teachers, institutions at large, and also in most in many cases, um, all citizens. Okay, so Marta, the floor is yours now. <laughs> Thank you, Paola. Um, so my name is Marta Bustillo. I am the digital learning librarian at the Library of University College Dublin. Um, and I'm originally Spanish, although I have lived in Ireland for, for many years. Um, and for me, it's really exciting to be part of, of the ENOL network because I am very interested in open education, but I don't feel like I am in a very kind of advanced level about knowing about open education, knowing how to create open educational resources and all of that. So. Um, when I when I discovered the Inoel network and I got the invitation to join, I was incredibly excited because I thought this is an opportunity to not just kind of lurk from the sidelines, but to actually contribute to something that I care passionately about. And so when Paola mentioned the possibility of creating an, a learning path for open education librarians, I immediately wanted to volunteer because, because I was talking to many colleagues from University College Dublin Library who were interested in this area but needed to know a lot more. And I was thinking, well, what can we do to make this path a lot easier? So I worked with uh, mostly Celine and, and Kinga and Chris um, to decide on which areas are areas that librarians want to get involved in and that they need to kind of upskill really quickly and then to try and identify a series of resources that are that are already out there and that would be useful for those of us interested in in this area um, and so we we started thinking about how we could go about this and it seemed that for the moment, the simplest thing to do would be to create an infographic um, which would lay out this path. And we identified three key areas that we thought would be really important to focus on. One would be finding and evaluating OER. The second one would be licensing and copyright. And the third one would be much more hands-on kind of developing and sharing open educational resources. Um, so each of us worked in a different area. I was looking at the finding and evaluating OER. Chris was looking at lic licensing and copyright. And then a little bit of all of us, but mostly Celine too, uh, about developing and sharing resources. And what we're finding is 
a lot of the material has been created um, that has been created it comes from North America and so it reflects the higher education landscape there and the copyright and li licensing situation there so what we want is to create a curated list of resources that all open education librarians can uh, use to train themselves to learn about open education and to start on the road of creating open educational resources but then really the advanced aim of this is to start taking the resources that we find and adapting them to reflect the specific requirements of the European open education landscape. So for instance, in terms of the language diversity that exists, the different copyright requirements in each country and all the, of those kinds of things. And it's been a really fascinating process. Uh, although, of course, it hasn't been without hiccups and I know Paola will uh, look at those uh, later on in, in this session but so we are almost there we we have the the basic bones of, of this infographic and we will be hopefully delivering it um, in not too long at a space of time um, and so we aim for this to become a resource that not just european librarians can use but also librarians from other places that will really help uh, establish a learning path for librarians in open education. Paola, I think that's all about as much as I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. Uh, also, this resource is not ready yet to be shared. As everything else that we are going to deliver, this is going to be delivered with a CC BY license for sure. Not only because, as Martha just said, uh, all libraries will need uh, to do a little bit of work if they want it in their own language, uh, but also because uh, maybe someone else is might elsewhere might be interested in reusing it, as we are reusing many resources created from uh, the North American landscape, for example, because they are great resources and it's just part of them that needs to be looked at uh, in order to be to fit into our scenarios also please consider that our let's call it let's call them copyright laws but we also have different names for this kind of laws in europe okay um, we have different laws and putting them together is not an easy task uh, yes. so uh, that's part of the job and uh, when librarians have to support students and teachers in their everyday activities, they need to know something about this, uh, which is referred to their own scenarios. Otherwise, it's not going to be helpful. And uh, this is part of the job that we are trying to, to do together. Um, Marta, would you, would you like to add something or? Otherwise, I would no, just to, to no, just to say um, the three areas that we focused on were the areas where we felt librarians can have more of a contribution to the open education landscape. And certainly uh, copyright and licensing is a massive issue. And I know it's not just in Europe, but in general. So that's an area that we need to focus on. Um, but also evaluating resources and, and being able to find the materials that are needed for each of the different disciplines. So, yes, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, and hopefully we are going to be ready soon uh, to share something. So just monitor our website and our resources and uh, we are going to tell you where to find our uh, outputs uh, it, during the presentation. Just be patient, because now we have to. to I, I will leave the floor again to Chris, who is going to tell you something about our open education jobs. 
Great, thanks again. Um, yeah, so our OE drops are, the idea here is a short video series um, for, again, it's sort of um, beginning activities to, to get people started with things, but specifically uh, created for, uh, to be easily consumable. And um, so videos that you can, uh, on, on the very basics of open education, again, uh, but um, something that newcomers can uh, consume while they're, you know, stopping to have a coffee, while they're commuting, you know, on the bus or the subway or, or the car or whatever, uh, walking or just taking a little break. So, uh, so that's the idea behind the OE drops. Um, so this uh, is also a, a work in progress. We've been working on a, an opening sort of series of, of, of two to three drops. We have uh, video recordings for two drops that I think are just about ready. And uh, in fact, we were just, as we were preparing for this session, uh, sort of hashing out the title for the second drop. So I think we finally mm -hmm. got it. Uh, and um, and so that that was over the Slack. Just by the way, in terms of communication channels, one of the things we're using a lot is the Slack. And it's I think it's really a handy, a handy tool there. Um, um, so what else is, it's, it's, I mean, it's been a nice, a nice uh, sort of uh, activity to work on in collaboration with others. We start out with a kind of a, a, a text for the video and, uh, um, uh, you know, good in that way of, of people putting sort of small contributions together uh, that come together to create something uh, nice and concise and, and meaningful uh, and hopefully impactful uh, as well. So, um, so, uh, so, so that's about it for OE Drops, I think. Um, but you know, watch out for that; it'll be coming out on the NOL's YouTube channel as well, much like uh, the rest of our video, uh, our video output. And we are willing to translate them in more than one languages, also. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, of course, we start with English. English is our uh, lingua franca, <laughs> and uh, we use it all the time. But uh, it's just a starting point for us, and. Uh, just imagine our first thought about the open education drops was that uh, maybe if we kept it simple and short, it, it would have been used during a coffee break or a short walk uh, when you don't have a lot of time, but you want to grab a bite of open education uh, in a very informal way. But also uh, this will allow us to translate them pretty quickly maybe and add them in more than one language. So also one of, of our points of attention is always to keep the format as simple as possible so that nobody feels overwhelmed by the format itself, instead of thinking about sharing the content in the easiest and quickest way possible with their own community. So thank you, Chris, for this insight on the open education drops. And uh, now let's move to the resources that uh, the NOL is uh, curating and that the NOL is producing because uh, we are uh, working on both actually. And I will leave the floor to Celine now. Thank you, Paula. Um, my name is Celine. Um, I am French, but have been living in Ireland for the last nearly 25 years. So I work in uh, Technological University of the Shannon and uh, became aware and involved with open education um, really only in the last two or three years. So I'm only at the start of the journey, really the, the concept of open education um, is slowly making its way up the list, in the agenda in I suppose the Irish um, higher education. Uh, sector, but a lot of work to be done. And uh, I suppose getting involved with the NOL and my NOL colleagues have really put things into perspective and is, is helping me to um, make my own colleagues in Ireland aware of the benefit of open education. So it's a fantastic network to be uh, involved in. So from what you've been hearing, um, there's a lot of activities going on in the network. Um, a consequence and a great consequence, a result of those activities is that we are actually producing an awful lot of resources. Um, and in order to produce, create those resources, 
we have to be able to access other resources that are already there. So we need somewhere to put the resources that we've created. And we also need somewhere to put the resources that we've accessed. So they can be accessible to all our members and I suppose to the wider public as well. Anybody with an interest in open education has to be able to access those resources. So we looked at different tools um, and we felt that Google documents themselves with endless list of links uh, were not necessarily the most efficient way to store our resources uh, or the resources we curated to support our fellow members. Um, most of our resources would be Google Docs, journal articles, book chapters, open courses, videos, plus the resources that my colleagues mentioned that we have created. Um, we sometimes have quite time and there isn't much to add and then suddenly we'll do let's say the likes of a hackathon um, on OER benefits and then we need to find spaces for approximately 100 links. So we decided to use um, an Opal tool user-friendly uh, for all our members. So we looked at uh, drops I think and then we looked at Wicklet and Wicklet was identified as a free, which is very important for our members, free open source tool to store all the links to our resources. It allows us to organize the resources into collections. And you might be already familiar with Wicklet. Um, and if you are, I'm sure you've noticed a recent change in the display. So we're now able to organize resources into columns, which means that we can actually create the aspects of different folders or sub collection. Wicklet is a very visual tool, uh, and again, this is very, very important as the majority of our members do not have English as their first language, so we have to be very mindful of that too. Um, all the resources accessed during the NOL network activities can be found in the Wicklet collection, all of them. Um, the last completed collection was the upcoming Open Education Librarian Learning Path infographic that Marta introduced earlier on. Um, so all the resources access to create the infographic will be released uh, shortly are available in the collections. Um, and uh, I'm just going to put the link to that particular one so you can see this is an example of um, the collection. This one is, is ready. Um, to ensure another thing, you see, the, when we create um, resources, the likes of the infographic, we envisage that this would be accessed online, but that is also going to be printed and displayed. So to ensure that the links of our resources are still available, if the infographic is produced in a printed format, we're actually adding QR codes linking back to the Wakelet collection. So this way, all the tools and all our resources um, remain live irrelevant of the format they're being used in so that's really um what i wanted to talk about today just you know to say that the the network in itself because of the amount of members we have and because of all the activities the network is actually creating an awful lot of resources but more to the point is accessing hundreds of i think thousands at that stage of resources so it is very important for us to have a central point to store all that as some kind of a repository, I suppose, for of links for the network. Paula? Yeah, and who can do this work better than librarians? <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a librarian myself, and I'm, I'm so thankful for having you with all your skills taking care of this part, which is really important for us. We have, uh, we have a, a message. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank it's you. Just Chris, me. For, just me yeah. making a language point. <clears throat> Absolutely. Exactly, Chris. Very, um, very yeah. au fait there. Uh, a start, a commencement. Yeah. So this could apply as well to our NOL. Ola. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> this is a nice coincidence. But uh, um, yeah, uh, another another activity that uh, I'm going to talk. With you about uh, now is uh, uh, the 
the, the tools that we've been working on together, starting from a, an hackathon activity <laughs> that we organized during the summertime. You can, you just have to imagine what does it mean to organize something in July, like an hackathon activity with members of a network who are volunteering in doing something on top of their everyday work. <laughs> it was fun, I have to tell you, but we've been working not by ourselves because we have the, um, Neil uh, uh, from the OER Africa giving us an input about the collecting resources that uh, uh, provide evidence-based um, case studies uh, about the benefits of open education. And we've been working on them uh, in order to create lists of benefits together during this hackathon activity, uh, and then to prioritize them with time. So the hackathon activity to work on the list of benefits lasted a couple of hours, but then we took some weeks in order to have more time and to think and rethink about uh, those lists of benefits and try to prioritize them according to the annual uh, landscape. So what we wanted to have uh, were not only tools that speak about the benefits of open education for different stakeholders, and we, are, uh, we shared actually yesterday morning our tools, and I will add the link to our Zenodo page or if any one of you in the team can add it, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, they are in a, an open format. Well, it's a PowerPoint format, actually, a PPT, unfortunately, because in order to keep the original format of the tools, we couldn't shift to a more open format in itself without losing all the uh, characteristics that we developed using Google Slides, actually at the beginning. The idea was to keep the format as easy as possible for people to reuse and adapt it to their own scenario. And thank you uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, if you add the link to, to the chat. Uh, so what we developed are three different kinds of tools. Twitter cards that are ready to be downloaded in a JPG format and uh, reused in Twitter. Uh, as they are, if you want, or adapting them to your languages if they are different from English, or adding your institutional colors, your logos, whatever you need. Also, a, a better background if you're willing to, etc. Because we kept the format very simple, and uh, we didn't share our annual version. We shared a template which doesn't have any logo in them but uh, we adapted our templates in order to uh, be the first to reuse it on one side, but also to share a template version that doesn't need anyone to remove things, but just to add their logo. And if they want, again, change the background or the colors or the font or whatever you're willing to. Uh, so we did this for Twitter cards, but we did this also for uh, a slide deck, uh, which can be easily reused by anyone when you are presenting about open education and you are willing to share with your audience uh, the benefits of it for different stakeholders. And in a minute, I will tell you which, uh, which were our uh, stakeholders first. Um, and then we also created uh, leaflets, leaflets in, in a format that can be easily printed and added to the walls of, uh, in our case, libraries, first of all, but also other places around universities or who knows, other contexts uh, like uh, schools or public libraries, uh, whichever use you think might uh, support open education is uh, welcome here. And those leaflets, are in a format that, again, is uh, uh, in the format of slides so that they can be easily changed by anyone, no proprietary uh, software needed. They can be opened with any open software that allows you to work on slides, but mostly you are willing to change the order of the benefits that are there, 
we added all the benefits that we found in the literature and uh, we are going to update them in time if we have evidence of uh, more. For sure, everyone is welcome to change the order according to the priorities of their own uh, context. Uh, because uh, it might be that uh, the, the Italian context, for example, which is not as advanced as uh, the Netherlands context is around open education, uh, needs to focus on more basic needs at, at first. And we need to show the benefits uh, for students, teachers, institutions, and the citizens at large, all people um, starting from different priorities. That's our context and uh, we should localize the presentations and uh, the leaflets for our own uh, landscape, but uh, it can be different in the Netherlands. It can be different if you uh, in your countries are willing to reuse them. So feel free to download them and to adapt them to your own scenarios. They are uploaded in a Zenodo page and I'm going to add the link now if it's not there yet so that you can have it in the chat. Oh no, it's already there. Thank you, Celine. <laughs> and uh, so we, we are willing to have uh, also a collection of your feedback. If you are going to reuse them, please come back to us and tell us if they are easy enough to be reused, first of all, because this was one of our aims. And if you have localized version in any other language, please share them with us because it would be our pleasure to collect them. And uh, what we are going to start uh, next week is a call for action within the annual to ask for translations. We already have uh, almost ready the Italian and Polish version of the tools, but we are going to, uh, we already have uh, volunteers for the Russian version, the Ukrainian one, the French one. So uh, the annual members are going to provide some of the existing languages, but uh, for sure it would be our pleasure to have more. So just reach out to us and let us know what happens. Uh, we are going also to share something about the process that we went through because it was not easy at all, to be honest, to find the best way to create tools starting not with our version, our institutional version, but having in our minds that our aim was most of all to produce templates and then to make to enable people to adapt them. And we, we tried it first, just in order to be sure that we were going to, uh, to go through the process ourselves. So let us know. And, um, and then after the benefits that are for sure meant to enlarge uh, and raise awareness around the UNESCO ER recommendation, as you can easily imagine, I think we can talk a little about the challenges that we went through. And uh, I would ask my, uh, my partners here in the presentation to open your microphone and share about the challenges that you encountered along the way. Um, I, can, I, I can quickly summarize what we have, but it would be better to hear from you directly, maybe, if you want. Can I just say that I, I mean, this seem, might seem silly, but for some reason, the one hour time difference it, it just it blows my mind every time and for because i'm originally from canada and i'm always thinking about time going in that direction now i think about i have to think about time going in the other direction but only by one hour so so that, that i find a little bit tricky for some for whatever reason um but you know i think i suppose it's one aspect of of collaborating over a distance like this particularly with large you know large sort of networks of people um, I think that's always, there's always challenges there. Yeah, just imagine about that, that our meetings are set in the middle of the lunch break, I would say, once a month, each Monday, it's always on Monday, and uh, we have people from uh, Portugal uh, uh, who are, and, and from uh, UK and Ireland, they are uh, uh, they started the meeting in uh, when it's uh, 12 midday for them, but in Tomsk, 
which is in Siberia. It's uh, around the six in the afternoon. So they are at the, de at the end of their uh, working days. And sometimes it's not as easy as you can imagine to, to have all of them together. That's why we record all the meetings and people are also happy about this because uh, it happens that uh, they can not be there. But the uh, time zones are always an issue because every meeting needs us to remind ourselves that we need all of the time to, to say each other, no, but it's not my time, it's your time. No, I was talking about <laughs> the, the other person time. <laughs> Paola, I think the, the other challenge, I, at least for me, and I'm pretty sure for everyone else, is that we are all super enthusiastic. We really want to get things done. But then you have to kind of balance that with, with the day job and with your life. And sometimes life and day job and email you know, network don't completely match up. <laughs> Um, so, you know, sometimes you think, oh, this will be done by the end of this week or by the end of this month. And then you realize the end of the month has come and it hasn't quite uh, been finished because life just got in the way. Definitely. And also, I would add that uh, English as a second language has been a challenge too. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, not only because it's maybe it's, I mean, for the majority of us, this is not our native language, but it's also that uh, this means that if you are shy or if you are not uh, uh, comfortable with making public mistakes, which I'm doing all the time, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but if you, yeah, if you're not comfortable with this and you don't accept that uh, uh, in this in yourself, well, you're not going to open your microphone. And uh, we as a network, uh, lose something anytime people take a step back and don't open their microphone to share their experience or to tell us if they have a problem or if they are facing an issue. Anytime we don't have those challenges clearly in front of us, we can't face them. So uh, just imagine that uh, we had the chance to talk with a group of people from uh, Ukraine, Kazakhstan and Russia recently. This was quite a challenge for all of us because we had an interpreter all the time. Uh, most of the people didn't use English as a second language either, okay? Some of them understood it quickly. Some others needed the interpreter to follow the, the, the path. And they are all uh, European countries and we are doing our best to involve them in our day, our everyday activities. So languages are a challenge. They are a great opportunity also because you just imagine the history behind those languages and all the resources that are there and that can be shared and uh, make also uh, learning different languages easier in time. But at first they are certainly one of our highest barriers. And uh, well, a lot of work to be done <laughs> on this side. Uh, and also about what Marta just said, we might, we might also um, share with you that uh, um, uh, time is it's a, it's an issue. Time to be, be online, to share uh, active involvement with other people in the network. Uh, is not always available and uh, also meeting different time zones is also uh, an issue when you have not a lot of time. Uh, and this is another um, problem for us when we need to take action very quickly. Um, what we are doing in the NOL, and I really would like to, to listen from the audience too, um, is supporting each other, being very patient. I would make it quick because I really would like to hear from the audience. We, we really negotiate and try to pull efforts in order to make it work. That's what we do. Being very welcoming with uh, life, not only with work issues, because we all have them. And uh, we have people in the room who just moved from one house to the other. <laughs> and who know very well 
what what uh, what happens when life is in between. We have a question from Cynthia. Um, when they are translated, will they uh, be made publicly available with the, the English versions? Um, so, are you, Cynthia, are you talking about the, the translations of the um, which, which kind of resources? All of, of all of our resources, or one resource in particular? Um, sorry, uh, I was looking at actually all because we're pretty much at our infancy in this, and and this is a significant thing for us right now in terms of developing that education and awareness program. Um, so, so we would love to be able to repurpose instead of having to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but we do have the two official languages Definitely. here in Canada. Definitely. So about the benefits, what I can tell you is that uh, they are going to be translated in French. I don't have a, a schedule yet for this because we are going to talk about this in our next annual meeting, which is next Monday. And uh, I prepared all the background work to coordinate uh, the efforts in the hopefully, hopefully easiest way possible for members so that they don't have to pull their time uh, in order to create templates or anything, but everything should be ready by Monday to ease their work on the translation side. And uh, as soon as the resources will be uh, uh, prepared, checked and uh, finalized, they will be for sure disseminated openly as everything else. Okay, so count on this, Cynthia. <laughs> but Cynthia, for the... Um learning path for librarians i think the translation for that will take a little bit longer um but i hope that there will be some <laughs> translations for that too it's just everything has to be done step by step okay any and other question you are you are you curious about anything Yes, because this session has flown. We have about two minutes left. <laughs> okay, we have a question from Jonathan. Uh, how often does it happen that something that works in one country does not work in another? Often. <laughs> <laughs> Very often. Often, yeah, because because uh, Jonathan, you have to imagine that uh, we are at very different level of uh, development, also uh, from the policy uh, perspective around open education and uh, for what is worth open access always uh, is uh, leading the way and then open education still follows at, at this moment and uh, well, uh, difference are always behind the scenes and also another issue is that we are not, uh, as we used to say, we are not lawyers also. So what happens when uh, there are differences in between countries? Well, we are either librarians or instructional designers or both, but uh, uh, we need uh, legal advice sometimes. So uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, an issue. Uh, and uh, and well, Jonathan, and the other thing is that although the, for those European countries that are members of the European Union, there is European legislation on th things like copyright that gets kind of, uh, that, that applies to all countries, then each individual country has to actually adapt or, or, or accept the legislation individually. Yeah. So that can take a long time. And in the meantime, there's all of these gray areas where nobody knows exactly where you are. So um, yeah, it can be tricky. We have another question from Kati. Interesting choice on languages you choose to translate. How did you decide on English and French? Well, we didn't decide. We started <laughs> no. from English. We started from English because it's the lingua franca, as I said, and most of us can count on a basic knowledge of English at least. And we also can rely on many resources that are at first developed with English. And uh, it's not only French, we are also working with other languages. So uh, we have, as I said, volunteers who are translating in uh, Polish, Italian, um, 
uh, Russian, maybe Ukrainian. Uh, I can I, I can rely on uh, German too uh, in time, and uh, let's see what happens with Greek and uh, Spanish. You know, we can uh, we can really uh, help a lot with languages. Paola, Jonathan is telling us that we need to conclude the session. Yeah. So, but <laughs> I, I think we that. have a, a few minutes grace. Like, uh, if anyone has any other questions, I think we can stay on for another couple of, say, five minutes. So, unfortunately, I have to stop the recording now. And um, but this the, the thanks session everyone. Room, the session room will remain open if you want to hang around and talk. The room can remain open for another fifteen minutes. So, feel free to stay here. Thank you, Jonathan.